Did I read books in November? I think so. Storygraph and Goodreads think I did. Do I remember anything about them? Not really. Hi everyone, Rosie here. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. As you know, it's time for my November wrap up and I don't know, I read a fair number of books this month. I think I finished 11 books in November, but it didn't feel like a good reading month. We'll get into that as we go. Let's just dive right in. The first book I finished in November was the audiobook of Emma by Jane Austen, which I have done a full review of, so I will link that up here. I actually listened to most of this book in October. I just had a couple hours left that I finished in November, but that is when I finished it, and that's when I reviewed it, so that's when we're going to include it. Since I did a full review, I'm not going to go into too much detail other than to say that this was my first real foray into classics in a while, I think. I probably read a classic like last month and have completely forgotten about it by now. Although I've avoided classics for a while because I thought I didn't like them, I had so much fun with this. I like It's not spoilers at all for my review to say that I enjoyed it so much. So if you haven't already seen it, definitely go check out that review and hear my thoughts in more detail. The second book I finished in November was A Case of Exploding Mangoes by Mohammed Hanif. This is a fictionalized account of a 1988 plane crash that killed the president of Pakistan and an American ambassador and also several other mem high ranking members of Pakistan's military and air force and stuff. This was dark and funny and not like most books I've read, but it was really fun. And I actually did a whole review about this one as well, so you can check that out up here. Then I finally finished one of my nonfiction November reads, Never Enough by Judith Grizel. This is all about the neuroscience of addiction, and it really highlights the extent to which addiction is a huge health issue in modern society. The author was an addict herself in her youth and then got sober, got a PhD, has worked in the field for like 30 years or something. So she has a really interesting perspective on this and I found the inclusion of her own experiences and her thoughts on what it was like for her was really interesting. I thought it was a really frank approach to the experience. She neither romanticized her experiences nor really heavily stigmatized it. She was really more interested in looking at it from a brain science way. Why do people become addicted to drugs? This book was a scientific look at how drugs affect our brains and how brains respond to, our, to drugs, both in general and looking at how specific drugs or specific classes of drugs affect our brains differently. You're probably familiar with the concept of the more drugs you do, the more your brain becomes tolerant and the more you need to get the same feeling, which is presented in this, but in so much more nuance and detail about how it actually works. And I found it fascinating. I'm not what I would call a sciencey person, but this was super readable, super approachable. You did not need to have a lot of scientific background to understand the concepts she was presenting. So that was awesome. It was very, very accessible, at least in my view. If you've read it, please let me know what your experience was. Even as someone who doesn't really have substance abuse issues, this book was fascinating. It really made me think about my own drinking habits, which like I said, I don't drink much at all, but this book will make you think about it. Don't read it right before you go to a big holiday party unless you want to feel kind of down about the whole thing. <laughs> I also finished The Yellow House by Sarah M. Broom fairly early in the month. This is what I would call narrative nonfiction about the author's family history in the city of New Orleans, starting with her mother's childhood in the 1940s and running all the way essentially to the time when Broom was writing this book. It really looks at the various ways how being poor and being from an underserved part of the city and from a part of the city that was often ignored by everybody has affected their lives throughout time. And then also how that really, really intensified in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, especially the sections about Hurricane Katrina. But this book in general was really heartbreaking because it's so zoomed in on this one family. And it's a family that the author obviously knows so well because it's her family. So you really see every Everything that's happening in relationship to people who you can vividly imagine because of how they're described. But at the same time, Broom includes enough general information and like data and stuff and historical context type stuff to make it clear that she's telling her family's version of this story, but there are so many families with their 
own version. This was a really good book. I'm really glad I read it, but it was not a new favorite or anything. Looking back on the month, because I finished this several weeks ago now, that might have been partially influenced just by like my headspace this month. I don't know. I've not been absorbing what I'm reading well, and I've not been connecting with what I'm reading very well. So maybe if I had read this in a different month, I would have absolutely loved it. Next up is a book I really did enjoy reading and that I have virtually no memories of now, and that is Every Word is a Bird We Teach to Sing by Daniel Tammet. This is a collection of essays on language, and I read it as a buddy read with Lana from Lana Ex Libris. It was honestly a great book to do a buddy read for because we had so much fun talking about it, and there were so many interesting thought-provoking things that it raised that was so much fun to discuss with someone else who had read the book. However, I made the foolish mistake of not writing up my notes as soon as I finished reading the book or as soon as we finished our discussion of it, and now I know that I loved it and I can remember absolutely nothing more. I mean, I remember a few of the topics, but I can't remember any specific thoughts I had about it. It's gonna be a common theme this month. I do know, however, that most of the essays in this book made me want to go find a whole book written about the topic, but in a good way, not a bad way. Some books do that in the sense where you read part and then you go, why have you stopped telling me about this? I wanna know so much more. In this case, it was more, wow, that was such a cool intro. I absolutely want to learn more about this. The next book I finished was Time Travel by James Gleek. This was a really, really interesting book, and I really don't think I had the mental energy to do it justice when I was reading it. It looks at time travel both in fiction and in pop culture, and then also from a philosophical side and from a scientific side. It's written in what I feel like is a very literary way, which is sort of unusual non-fiction, but it's very fun and snappy. I don't know, those sound contradictory, but it makes sense when you read it. I have this sentence in my review that I'm just going to read out loud because I'll never remember how to say it. Feels like the words version of an artistic indie movie with really interesting and intentional, intentional camera work and music and acting, but relatively sparse language that leaves the viewer to fill in the blanks. Obviously this book didn't have sparse language. It's a book, it didn't have illustrations, it was entirely language, but that was the vibe. You know what I mean? I also learned so many cool tidbits. For example, H.G. Wells was a socialist, an advocate of free love, and a keen bicyclist? Now I wanna read his books. Like, that sounds so cool. And really, that was an effect it had overall. It really makes me want to go and pick up a whole bunch of these science fiction classics and science fiction cult favorites that previously I didn't really have much interest in reading, but having heard his discussion of them, now I wanna go read them all and maybe even like listen to a literary podcast about them. I don't know. It had me really excited about science fiction. <laughs> Throughout most of the month, I was listening to The Covent Garden Ladies by Hallie Rubenhold. This is by the same author as The Five, which I absolutely adored when I read it this summer. But this one was written much earlier. I think this one was published in, I wanna say 2011 or 2013, and The Five came out in 2000. 19. And from what I'd seen in reviews and stuff, it wasn't quite as good, she hadn't quite hit her stride yet, and that was definitely the experience that I had. This book is about prostitution in London in sort of the 1750s through end of the 1700s-ish. It centers around this book called The Harris List, which was essentially a guidebook or a directory of prostitutes working in the area that was published annually for over 40 years, I think, in the 1700s. On the whole, I just found the book wasn't super well executed. In the first part, the timelines were really confusing. Maybe that's because I was listening to it, so I wasn't catching dates as much, but I just found myself really confused about when things were happening and what was going on. There's also sort of three main characters that we, not characters, three main people that we follow throughout the book, and it was not clear to me from the beginning how they were all involved. Two of them were pretty clear. One of them was a pimp and one of them was a prostitute, but the third was this wannabe poet, and I was sort of going, why are we spending so much time with this person? What does he have to do with this? Because you don't find out what his role in the whole events is until almost halfway through the book. On the whole, I think I just would have been much more interested in learning about the prostitutes themselves and not, I wasn't so much interested in learning about the men and women who were exploiting them. There's obviously not that much information to go on about specific people, but what I found were the most interesting parts of this book were when it got into these women's place in society and how they found themselves in these situations and what the repercussions were. That was the part that actually interested me, not so much the personal life of a pimp. Closely tied to all that, there is 
a lot of passing references to sex trafficking, to rape, to sexual abuse of children. It's both explicit and also really not given the space it should be. It was a fine line between portraying the information in its historical context, but in doing so it just didn't really work for me. I would have liked a more discussion about those aspects and more discussion about the implications of that. As literally every review of this says, there's a section in the middle that just lists entries from the Harris list, which I think would have been far more interesting if it was spread throughout the book. As it was, I think it was a solid hour or two of the audiobook, which made for some strange lunchtime walks where I'd spent like an entire hour out for a walk on my lunch break, listening to these entries being read about these women. Honestly, if I was reading an ebook or a physical book, I probably would have just skipped that part because it was just very strange. As I alluded to at the beginning, I knew going in that this was not going to be as great as The Five based on other reviews I had seen, but even knowing that, unfortunately, it was kind of a letdown. The Five was a hands down five star read for me. I absolutely adored it. I thought it was incredible. I sort of expected, okay, maybe this one's going to be sort of a four star read. It's good, but it's not amazing. And I ended up giving it a three star, which for some people is average. I give pretty high rankings, so three star is pretty low for me. The last nonfiction book I read in November was Lowborn by Carrie Hudson. This is a memoir about the author's experiences growing up in pretty extreme poverty in Britain, interspersed with her reflections on writing the book and revisiting the places she lived growing up as an adult. It was simultaneously incredibly heartbreaking and also surprisingly readable. I feel like a lot of books like this are the type of books where you want to read them, but it's really hard to actually make yourself read them. But this one I did not have that issue with. What I did have an issue with is writing any kind of review about it. I enjoyed it. I'm glad I read it. I would highly recommend reading it. And honestly, I don't know what to say about it. So honestly, I'm not going to try. You can probably tell I just have not been reading deeply this month, I think is a good way to put it. I've read a fair bit and I enjoyed a lot of what I read. I just haven't been really soaking it in and thinking about it and formulating my own thoughts. It's been much more transitory. So I'm not going to do a disservice to this wonderful book and give you garbled, half-formulated thoughts. I'm just gonna say it was great, I really liked reading it, and I don't really have a review for it. I will say trigger warnings for child abuse, neglect, sexual assault, rape, and discussion of abortions, and probably other things that I'm forgetting. The last weekend of the month was my birthday, and I decided to take a break from all the nonfiction because I'd actually done pretty well on that front this month, and just lean into some good, fun, escapist fiction. So the first book I read was Snake Agent by Liz Williams, this is about Detective Inspector Chen, who works in Singapore Three's police department solving supernatural and mythical crimes, and in this one he has to investigate illegally trafficked souls. This is the first in a series and I thought the world building was really well done. It was simultaneously really natural and also really effective. The key information about how this world and this magic system worked was revealed clearly but in a plot relevant and not info dumpy way while also being revealed early enough in the story that you're not sitting there going, how the fuck does anything work here? This book really features the heaven and hell as massive bureaucracies trope, which I don't know why, but I just adore that. It's one of those things that if a book includes that, I'm probably going to like it. As is so much fun with that trope, there's a lot of gray areas and maneuvering and everyone trying to optimize their outcome versus their rivals, even on their same side, which was so much fun. That carried through to the character's decision making. A lot of it came down to characters trying to figure out what is the right thing to do here? How should I react? What action should I take? Which for me is just so much more interesting than characters who go, I'm on the side of heaven and I'm good and therefore I only ever do things exactly the way I should do. That's kind of boring, right? One thing I will say is I don't know how much this book is based in any actual Chinese religious or cultural beliefs. That's not a topic I know much about whatsoever, and the author is a British woman who I don't think has any Chinese ancestry, I might be wrong. So I'd be interested in hearing sort of an own voices review and see what that has to say, but 
I found it really interesting, I thought it was a cool setting, and I definitely want to pick up the sequel at some point. Next, I finished The Two Towers by J.R.R. Tolkien, which I had been reading throughout the month for the Tolkien Along. This was so much fun! I expected the first half to be amazing. I always love the section that focuses on Merry and Pippin, and Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli. That was amazing, as expected. What I did not expect was how much I loved the second half of this book. In my head, I really did not enjoy the Frodo, Sam, and Gollum part of this book. I just sort of always thought, oh, that's a section that honestly in past rereads I've just skipped, or sometimes I've read it first and then gone back and read the first half because I like it more. But I thought, no, you know what, I'm gonna do it properly this reread, I'm gonna read it from start to finish as Tolkien intended it, and I loved it! It was so much more fast-paced than I remembered, the characters were so much better than I remembered, I just don't know what I read the last times I read the second half of this book, because it was not this. On the whole though, this is the first time I've read these books where I feel like I can say I'm liking the books as much if not more than the movies. And I say that as a die-hard fan of the movies. I have loved the Lord of the Rings movies since well before I even read the books. So I don't know if it's just that I'm a bit older now, if I'm coming at them from a different lens, what's going on, but I'm so here for it. It makes me so happy how much I'm enjoying these books. <laughs> the last book that I finished in November, and I actually finished this on November 30th, was Penric and the Shaman by Lois McMaster Bujold. This is a sequel to Penric's Demon, the first Penric and Desdemona book, which I read over the summer, and this one takes place four years later after Penric has completed his training and is now being sent out on a mission on behalf of his employer. I won't get too much into the plot because it's a sequel and I always feel weird about talking about the plot of sequels. If people may not have read the first one, but what really struck me reading this was just how much she does in so little space. This is a novella, I think it was like 160 pages, but there is so much plot and so much world building without it ever feeling crowded. It's honestly made me want to read more novellas and of course to continue reading this series because I'm in love. It's so good. This was also exactly what I needed at the end of the month. It was super engrossing while also feeling super manageable to read. Sometimes you want some escapist fantasy, but you don't want to dive into something that looks like it could concuss you if you drop it while reading. So this was perfect. I also had one audiobook that I DNF'd this month, that was the Sawbones book, The Hilarious Horrifying Road to Modern Medicine by Sydney McElroy and Justin McElroy. I picked this one up because it was short, it was on Scribd, I wanted an audiobook to listen to for a couple days before my subscription rolled over and I could get to the ones I really wanted to read, and I thought, hey, history of gross medicine, that sounds cool, I'm into that. Once I started listening, I realized that it was the book written by a couple who had had a podcast on this topic for many years, and I was like, perfect! They're probably gonna be really good at audiobooks, right? They've got a successful podcast. I was wrong. The writing was just really disjointed, and it felt like I was just having a series of short facts read at me without any continuity or explanation or real linkages, and unfortunately on top of that, the information just wasn't that interesting. I'm not someone who would consider myself an expert on the history of medicine by any means, but there really wasn't much in this book that I didn't already know. And in fact, a lot of the topics presented went into less detail than I already knew, not more. So the combination of not that great information and poor delivery, because I'd be fine with information I already knew if it was enjoyable to listen to. I'm someone who happily rewatch movies and reread books, and so I'm not opposed to no new information, but it should be enjoyable. So I DNF'd this one when I realized that I was avoiding going for walks at lunch because I didn't want to listen to this audiobook. I thought, that's silly, I need to get back to listening to something that I actually want to listen to, and that will actually get me out of my dark basement apartment. As I said, November was a weird reading month. I read a fair number of books, I think it was 11 total, out of which I think I had seven nonfiction? Does that make sense? I don't know, six or seven nonfiction, I think. So that was great. I had more than half of my books were nonfiction this month, so nonfiction November I think is a success in that front. There was one book on my TBR that I didn't get to, that was The Age of Wonder by I think his name was Richard Holmes, and it was just too much. Like, I had too many things I was trying to fit in and trying to get through, and I didn't want to put more pressure on myself, so I decided not to read that one. I'm sure I'll get to it eventually, but this just wasn't the month for it. And yeah, on the whole, I just feel like I've had a weird reading month. Maybe I've just had a 
weird month in general. I'm hoping that's better in December. Let me know down below if you read any of these, what did you think about them? And what did you read in November? Did you love it? Was it a good reading month? Was it a bad one? If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you would like to see more of my videos, please hit subscribe and thank you for watching.